Rupal, welcome, buddy. How are you doing today? Good. Thanks for having me. Can you hear me okay? I hope I haven't scared you off yet. No, so. not at all. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think uh, we're going to transition a little bit to competitive ecosystems and innovation and, you know, some of the stuff that Kerry uh, said rings true to me. I, you know, I'm a huge proponent of design thinking and, and really around student agency. And the big enemy that I see over the last 15, 20 years is this kind of linearity, this way of thinking uh, that kind of shows up with how we deliver higher education, how we build software and systems. And it's usually a catalyst, like a shock to the system that really changes things. 2008 was a huge shock to the system economically. Uh, there's lots of defunding that was going on in higher education and kind of reevaluation of how some of these things should be delivered to students. And uh, that created uh, you know, different funding models. And some states, I know uh, Mark has talked a lot about Arizona. Arizona was pretty much ground zero for the deinvestment of higher education. And that probably necessitated a lot of institutions to kind of go survive and do things on their own in ways that nobody else has seen, whether it's Rio Salado College at Maricopa, uh, ASU with Michael Crow, University of Phoenix, obviously with Dr. Sperling, but that kind of started in the 70s and 80s, kind of running a non-traditional education framework. So, you know, I think that's the intersection of a lot of things, two or more things that have kind of shown us the way that uh, things can be done differently. And most recently, you know, with Uber and Airbnb and Amazon, the cloud computing power, the uh, focus on the end user uh, really kind of takes me to this whole area of kind of student agency. And how do you make some of these existing IT systems more relevant for today versus, you know, starting from scratch and kind of having to pour millions and millions of dollars into new systems is really, uh, I think, a lot simpler than people think. It's really, how do you put some of these students and people that use these products front and center uh, and kind of design the experience around them? And I know it's challenging for some institutions because they have a motivation to make sure students stay on a path, spend money with that institution. But the reality is, is the students are swirling, right? They're going to community colleges, they're going to four-year institution, they're learning things on YouTube and they're gaining skills. So that recognition that they're gonna, it's this pastiche of things and kind of meeting them where they're at and truly meeting them where they're at and designing things in a way uh, that makes sense for, for them. But one thing that I always talk about is, you know, schools are still building these large student centers where they're housing the financial aid advisors, academic advisors, they're calling students, uh, they're available nine to five. Well, the reality is, is the non-traditional students, the more common student, they can't come in physically nine to five. They don't really want to talk to people. There's a generational gap between people who want to take phone calls and answer them versus getting text messages. So it's really about kind of changing the way that people think, getting out of kind of this linear mindset and how things used to be. The reality is that we all live in a non-linear world. And so building products and making existing solutions and products focused around that can have, you know, those are small moves with big wins, right? So just a slight pivot in kind of how you think about what your, what the outcome is, right? And um, so that's a big part of like what I think about and, and talk about a lot in terms of IT systems. You know, I'm not an academic, I'm not, you know, can't provide advice on pedagogical uh, improvements, but I think as a whole, as an industry, you know, we can keep shilling software as the kind of silver bullet for a lot of these things, but really if we're not focused on kind of what, what the actual user and consumer cares about more, uh, we'll just kind of keep putting stuff out there that uh, doesn't realize the, the, the goals of what, you know, that institution is hoping for. Hey, Rupal. So Rupal, you, you used an interesting word there that I want to tee off of, and that is consumer. Yeah. Um, because I think increasingly the, the idea of the education, you know, we got to serve the education consumer. Um, if you think about addressable market and, you know, both a wider addressable market and more targeted focus in certain sectors, because it's just more competitive. Um, so when I think of education consumer, I like to get, you know, maybe get your thoughts, stimulate some discussion here. Uh, I think of an education consumer could be a company. It could be an agency or a government or, um, and, and to me, there's a, a it, it's not, we said, oh, it's not just traditional students. Now it's non-traditional students. And I, I feel 
I feel like we need to expand that further because we're in a knowledge-based economy, not just here in the U.S., but in the world. So I wonder about your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, it's funny how we create these categories. That we, in one of these calls that Matt, that you had organized, someone made a good point that you know we do traditional versus non-traditional students, a degree seeking versus non-degree. Our whole thinking has to change and kind of what the goals are. And I think that that there's a lot of people at the table for that too. You're talking about accreditation too, right? The SACs or you know HLC and kind of what we think is really important for the economy for you know citizens. Uh, it's not really aligned with where we're going in the future. And we may not know everything in the future, but we know that there's a big group of people that need to be educated and uh, whether that's credentialed or not, you know, that's a, that's a discussion we need to have, but we're not meeting the needs for lots of people all the way down to uh, early childhood, to K-12, to higher ed. And even those are kind of strange buckets. Too. So, I mean, I'm a bit of a nihilist when it comes to all of this stuff because we're just living in, uh, in a model that existed for 100, 200 years. Maybe we just need to burn everything down and kind of recreate a model. Um, I don't know, but we've got we to recognize that there are these frameworks and ideas and thoughts and barriers that are keeping us from you know, reaching progress. Now, there are a whole slew of companies, the VC community, and a lot of folks that are motivated, uh, like everyone on this call to go solve this problem. Um, but there are other things that are kind of, you know, foundational that still need to be removed or hurdles that we need to get through to kind of achieve some of the goals. And, and Mark, I know we've talked about underserved populations, people that don't really fit in higher ed, a uh, four year or a two year, how do we get to those folks and provide them some skills and education? It's a hard problem to solve. And, um, you know, I, I would like to think that higher ed can solve those problems, and I know they can in many cases, but it's really going to take, you know, something else. And it's going to take more shocks to the system to kind of change the way that people think, especially with the pandemic. We've uh, lots of changes have occurred, and we still haven't seen all of them. Uh, so I think this is a big opportunity to, to take a stab at it. Hey, hey Rupal, really quick. And, and the chat is on fire. Everyone who is is on there love it love it keep keep it going there's a lot of dialogue going on so rupal we're we're in this competitive ecosystem which is totally different than pre-pandemic well it was starting to get here it just accelerated in, in a much different way yeah when we think about uh, us moving forward and and having this competitive like mindset and because students have the choice now the, the the border walls of the campuses have come down you can now go to different places, even though there's a, you know, some presidents like, hey, we are, our in presence is a value, which I think is fine. And that's going to be a driver, but there's going to be a lot of other uh, people that say, hey, I, I want to go elsewhere. How does innovation um, get accelerated by these institutions who recognize that in order for them to compete, they have to be innovative? Can you give us a little bit of that thought, thought process and then adding me and Mark worked on this quiller last night, so it's just refresh, uh, fresh in my head, is how do you gain, with that innovation, how do you gain a broader market, broader reach, you know, going global, all these things, because that's what's going to make you different um, in terms of how you compete from last year to this year. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a recognition that, you know, whether it's SNU or ASU, I mean, those are analogs that a lot of people use all the time that, you know, in the case of Arizona, you've de-invested so much in higher ed, you kind of wonder uh, how much is that really for the citizens of Arizona? It actually gives them license to go outside of the market and find more opportunities. Same thing with Penn State. They're kind of a, they're not really a state entity. They're a state related entity with World Campus and SNU and other things. So they have license to go do something that's dramatically different and think about the consumer or student in a way that other, you know, institutions are kind of, you know, hamstrung. And in terms of innovation, I think it's this willingness and recognition that there are other, you know, needs and wants by students, not just within the confine of that institution. I'll, I'll give you a little short story. It's, you know, we were early days at a startup and we were working through a design for degree planning solution for students. And it was just this one client in this one moment where they're saying, can we sh not show the tuition? Can we not do this or move? something around with the tool. And it just struck me that, wow, the student really needs to know that. 
and the motivations and the interests of an institution are fundamentally different from many of these students. And that's okay because they're looking for their own interests, but students really, if we're talking about having fundamental change, you know, within the US and we need to have break these kind of ways that we're thinking and really put the student at the center. And I know that's an overused term, but I think those institutions that are willing to do that, like Uber did with the taxi world and Redfin and Airbnb, enormous amounts of shift in, you know, market from an incumbent old way of thinking to a new way of thinking. So it's really just kind of having the guts to do it and some players will do it and they'll be so far ahead and others will have to follow. Um, you know, just, it, you kind of have to unpack all the, the things that hold uh, some institutions back and in, in, uh, going back to Arizona where many would say, look, defunding higher ed there is, is horrible for those institutions. Well, it's actually kind of liberating in some ways too because now they can do things that they've never done before. So uh, it, it's gonna be regionally specific timing uh, but it's going to take someone to, to really act on it too and seize that moment. So, that, you know, that, that's interesting. And here's, here's the kind of um, you know, tension I sense, or at least the, the hypotheses of some of the stuff I wrote, is that we're, we're at this moment where institutions need to act or be prepared. And part of that preparation is having um, the right technology investments but they don't necessarily have a, a clear direction or a master plan or some cases even executives that have that have decided what needs to be done and, and so that's here, therein lies the concept of IT, investing in IT for agility for dealing with with opportunities and risks that are still on the other side of the horizon um, so be, you know because of your expertise and experience um, both building products and, and implementing and, and engaging with a, a wide range of customers. I wonder if you could you know, talk a little bit about what kind of IT gives you that business agility, like how tie that to the, the moment, if you could. Yeah, I mean, I think, you, you know, we have these monolithic systems and people will look at, you know, uh, back office systems as something that is cumbersome and hard to use and, you know, uh, difficult. I think you can take a look at those things and, and shift the experience on it, you know, design thinking. And you can actually make things that have been around for 20, 30, 40 years faster. You can automate things. And it's really just kind of redesigning a few things and thinking about the outcomes that you're looking for. There may be some gold in that system and you know, whether it's a CRM or a user interface or something like just kind of burning the house to go build a new one isn't really the solution. And, and agility has to be the defined for everyone. Um, and thinking about outcomes, the, the, the metaphor that I use sometimes is, you know, if you're putting up a picture or painting in your room, you know, the outcome that you're looking for is potentially a hole in the wall so you can have a nail there. And you can choose to go buy a $100, $200 drill from Home Depot to go put that hole in the wall, or you can just go find a nail and punch a hole in the wall. The outcomes are the same. The cost and the process were completely different. And so it, it's just thinking slightly differently with you know, uh, index around that outcome and how you can achieve it can, can make a huge difference and save money and, and achieve an outcome a lot faster. So, you know, it's, it's, everyone's going to have to define it for themselves. Uh, everyone's in different situations, but um, if there's a clear view and you're being real about what you're attempting to do, uh, I think that everybody has a chance to do something transformative in just a, you know, few easy moves or short moves. You know, just to share something from Mark's question and Rupal, what you shared, um, couldn't agree more. But the, imagine if 50 years ago we started, because we need to do this, but imagine if we were doing this for the last 50 years, the ability to adapt to change is a critical skill. Because look at what we're seeing, look at, the, look at half the text messages or the chats coming in. It's we're in institutions that have an inability to change. And so we need to make sure because there's always been new technology, changes in technology, but the pace of change is lightning quick right now. We all know that we're living through it, um, let alone a pandemic, which is not even you know outside of that, but especially with it. So teaching our kids um, and teaching them how to adapt to change along with some of what's been shared here a moment ago around agility and resilience. These are key skills because you can learn new technical skills 
But without those, we, we, have, we put the walls around us, right? We wanna knock the walls down. Um, so this is really, I think, a key thing that we need to focus on going forward as well. So how do we, how do we take that, Steve, and thank you. Um, how do we take that change mindset, apply it to leaders on campuses? And when I talk about it as, you know, there's these levels of leaders, right? There's uh, what I call the P-suite, which is the presidents and chancellors and provosts. There's these C-suites, which has strategy. There is these D-suites, the directors and deans that are really driving the day-to-day -day and, uh, and units. And then there's the O-suite, right? All of And the O-suite is the one that are on the, on the ground, just interacting with students. Um, change has to come through all four of those areas. And so how does... How do, how do we, in this competitive landscape, get them to recognize that if that change does not occur, and, and part of the discussion we had was, you don't wanna necessarily, we always know IVs and R1s, honestly, I don't wanna talk about the change there, because you know what, they're, they're in a Titanic boat, and they're in a boat right now that is, is gonna be fine. It's these mid-markets that have these four areas that change is gonna be really important to them how do they how do they recognize that change is required to be um, competitive and innovative? I, I, I think the you know folks at all those levels need to see how this has worked in other industries or in their industry. They need to see the stories. They need to kind of you know feel it deeply on uh, that these are things that they can do. I would I don't know if they do much higher ed work anymore, but there's an organization called Ideas 42 that is solely focused on behavioral science and design thinking. Design thinking is a component of it. Behavioral science is another piece to it that is a pretty deep subject. In fact, I think the Nobel Prize uh, three, four years ago was in economics was on behavioral science. And it's this idea that you know you're, you're designing things for human systems. There's a lot of things you can do and affect huge change by, you know, again, these small moves. And I've used a lot of those articles in the past in my presentations to say, hey, you know, you could have huge impact if you just do slightly different things. And it doesn't always involve technology. And if everybody owns that along different chains and they're educated in that in some ways and people are talking about it, you know, people are going to read up more on it. So we need more articles. We need more, you know, stories and examples of how people are achieving this. And then they'll have to kind of figure it out in their own domain uh, and, and apply it. But I think that the more we have, you know, in that uh, content, uh, I think the more we'll see some of those changes occur. Yeah. So let me, um, let me tee off that as well, at Rupal. I, you know, because my sense is that we're, you know, we're talking about change, we're talking about shifting mindset and how that maybe it comes from the top, you know, it could start a number of places, but um, my sense is that waiting for that change to come from the top to make investment decisions about how to structure your operations, how to invest in IT is for a lot of institutions, that's probably best case or a recipe for irrelevance. In some cases, it's, it's going to be a unplanned existential choice. Um, and so this idea of, can you start thinking, and, I, and that's why I wanted to kick off with design thinking, and now look, and why I brought, you know, why we're talking, I think, about Arizona, because you've got these very different institutions in terms of the, initially the markets they were in, the markets they were going after, um, but I think arguably have shown the most innovation-fueled growth of almost, certainly any region, any tight region, in the country, if not the world. I mean, Arizona State is literally building a new product to address the global market, you know, the Laureate market, so to speak. Um, when I work with those institutions, what struck me was there were commonalities in, in the way they thought about their business and in the way they invested in IT. They're, they're using different student information systems, a plethora of LMSs, et cetera, but there were some things that were common that um, I think really built the foundation so that when the reflexes came at a low level or a large level, they had the capacity to act. Right. And, and, and that, now that's my perspective, but I, I wondered what you think and, and what others on the call might think about that. 
Well, I mean, I think the tail's got to wag the dog a little bit too, right? I mean, it's, you got to create these moments where like, we've got to achieve 50, you know, Western Governors University is another example. We're, there's a demand out there. We're going to go from 20,000 students to 120,000 in three years. And we need a system that can handle non-comp or competency-based, non-term based learning. And so you, you know, the systems that we have right now may not be able to handle that, right? So you've kind of create this moment where people have to go solve that problem and that they're given the license to fail and, you know, keep designing and stuff. So it's going to be a mix of a lot of those things. I, I think, you know, Michael Crow and there's always, you know, even with Maricopa, Linda Thor has been incredible with Rio Salado changing kind of the online uh, domain for community colleges. So if you look back, it's usually like a, an individual, a moment in time, a need to do something scrappy. And then, you know, sometimes it's technology led, sometimes it, you know, they're a little bit of a laggard, but, you know, they make it happen. And it shows us uh, a new way of thinking. And once you kind of literally walk out of Plato's cave, you can't unsee those things anymore. You see a new world and a new reality and people start to follow and try to mimic that. And that's a good thing because, you know, then they're more responsive to their region they're competing and we get better products and better outcomes. And, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to define, but it, it happens and it should happen more often. Great. Hey, I see that. And we have, we have special guests that pop in. We see Brian Alexander in the house. Way to go, Brian. Good to see you. If you guys don't follow his uh, Thursday uh, uh, forum, it's, it's pretty amazing. So uh, definitely uh, catch him. And I see Kelly uh, jumped on. Kelly, we're just going to wrap a little bit uh, here uh, and just talking. You know, this is really interesting because when we think about innovation, competitive, and what the needs are and change, it actually starts with design thinking. It, it actually starts with what uh, Carrie talked about, is that you have to start to know who you're serving, what their needs are, what their moments of matter, and then you design the system to address that. Um, Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Well, so what, I, I, what's, your, what's your alternate thought of that? Well, you know, as, as Rupal noted, the, the, a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of the strategy, the strategy trying out some of the models ha have, been, have been done. And so I mentioned commonalities and, and I'll say, like there's, there's not an institution out there that, that is growing that hasn't either deployed or in the process of deploying growing an online strategy, okay? You can check that one. What do you need to grow your online strategy? You need an engagement platform. So all of those institutions in Arizona have a, the only common platform they have is the CRM. Um, they have multiple student systems on some of the campuses. Um, you've got to have analytics. You've got to understand the data and there's plenty of packages out there today. And you have to have a modern integration architecture to allow you to be flexible. Um, in my mind, you can start making that, and you have to start making that investment almost irrespective of where your executive team is in their thinking, because, because some things are just inevitable. And, and I think the, that modality for, for the market we're talking about, mid-tier and community colleges to stay relevant and potentially build in, you know, take advantages of the risks and opportunities coming up. I don't think there's any argument about it. It's just how aggressively you pursue that. And, and I think it's important to convey that to institutions that are maybe think they need to wait. And, and, I, and I don't think they can afford to. Yeah. You know, the, the, the thing that I, I think is these big, lar large ERP, which, you know, get beat up and I beat them up sometimes. Um, I believe that if they would use a design thinking model, if they if they'd incorporate some change management, if they would incorporate, you know, the transformational mindset, that these ERPs will do really well. And also let's set expectation. We know these ERPs aren't gonna meet every need of these unique campuses that we all have, right? Just let's just, let's just all say amen to say, your ERP is not going to be the only thing you use in house to serve your students. So let's start this expectation. And then, so how do we integrate with all these technologies, Mark, you talked about, we're gonna be having some discussions on analytics, because I think the ERPs in order to really um, do well moving forward, we got to set expectations, recognize that there's some things aren't going to be right, put the right people in place that are going to make the change and then really drive it. And I think uh, design thinking 
um, allows for that because it actually makes the, I call the consensus driven discussions happen much more earlier. So.